If you were going to be executed tomorrow morning at the Tower of London on the orders of your spouse in front of a couple of thousand people for crimes you didn't commit, what would you wear? That was the question facing Queen Anne Boleyn, second wife of Henry VIII, in the hours before her death on the 19th of May 1536. And in this video from History Calling, I'm going to tell you not just what she chose, but why she chose it. Because believe it or not, there was a whole etiquette around how to dress for death in Tudor England if you were a member of the elite and going to the scaffold. Anne's outfit, from the fabrics she chose to the style of her hood and the cut of her dress, tells us a lot about her self-image and her understanding of how clothing was used to communicate to an audience. Furthermore, it shows that this famously fashion-savvy queen knew how to make a statement right up to her dying breath. Boleyn was sentenced to death on the 15th of May 1536 and had a few days to prepare herself as best she could for what was coming. Along with praying for forgiveness for her sins, taking the sacrament and deciding what her final words would be, she also had to choose the clothes she would die in. She'd been imprisoned in the tower since her arrest on the 2nd of May and had a smaller than usual wardrobe with her to pick from. When she stepped out of her lodgings on the morning of the 19th to be executed on a scaffold built here, next to the White Tower, the spectators got their first look at what she had selected. We have several descriptions of what she apparently wore. The first source is known as the Spanish Chronicle, because it was originally written in Spanish by an anonymous author. It says that she wore, quote, a night robe of damask with a red damask skirt and a netted coif over her hair. This document is notoriously unreliable, though. The account it gave of her final speech, which you can hear all about in my video on the execution of Anne Boleyn, linked on screen and in the description box, is vastly different to what other sources record, for instance. And it also claimed that Anne's father died of grief several days after her, when in fact Thomas Boleyn lived until 1539. Next, we have a document, also originally written in Spanish, by an anonymous imperialist writer, which we can tell in part not just by the language, but by their hostility to Anne, who they refer to as having been unjustly called the Queen. Its real date is unclear. It's dated the 16th of May, which can't be correct because that was before the executions it describes of Anne's brother George and the Queen herself. But the level of detail it contains suggests that it was composed by an eyewitness not long after her death. It says that after she had made her final speech, quote, she was then stripped of her short mantle, furred with ermines, and afterwards took off her hood, which was of English make herself. A young lady presented her with a linen cap with which she covered her hair, and she knelt down, fastening her clothes about her feet, and one of the said ladies bandaged her eyes. This source seems much more reliable than the Spanish Chronicle, and I would be inclined to take its information as being mostly true, making allowances for some small details which the author may have forgotten to include or misremembered. Finally, we have a letter written on the 10th of June 1536 in Portuguese and sent to a man in Lisbon, which also describes George and Anne's deaths. The author tells us that Anne was, quote, wholly habited in a robe of black damask made in such guise that the cape, which was white, did fall on the outer side thereof. This same writer continues that after she had made her final speech, she took her coifs from her head, which I suspect is a reference to her hood, and delivered them to one of her ladies, then put on a little cap of linen to cover her hair. Just before she was killed, her ladies wrapped a bandage around her eyes. This source's main weakness is its obvious hostility to Anne and the inaccuracies it contains, for it falsely states elsewhere that the Privy Council had declared her daughter Elizabeth to be the child of her brother George Boleyn and attributes a second speech to her made to her ladies just before she died, but which no other source mentions. That said, its date of the 10th of June places it barely three weeks after her death. Other details, such as her main speech, tally with other sources, and crucially, its account of her outfit chimes very well with the imperialist source I just mentioned. There would also be little reason to lie about her outfit, whereas the inaccurate details regarding her speech and the paternity of Elizabeth were useful as ways to slander her. 
So if we bring these descriptions together and look at where they overlap, what we get is a picture of Anne wearing a dark coloured dress, probably grey or black damask, with a short fur-lined cloak over the top. This cloak was probably ermine, as the imperialist writer says, because that tallies with the Portuguese writer's description of it as being white, and if the fur of a stoat, which is what ermine is, is taken from it in winter, then it is indeed white. She had an English-style gable hood on, like the one you see her wearing in this image, and after she removed it, she put a linen coif of unknown colour over her hair to hold it in place. That coif probably resembled the cap you see in this image, which is supposedly of her. The final piece of clothing, if we could call it that, that she ever donned, was a blindfold or bandage around her eyes. Despite what you see in movies and TV shows about her life, there is no suggestion that she was wearing any jewellery that she had to take off before her death. Though if you are interested in her jewels, do check out my video on her famous bee necklace, which I'll leave linked for you. Personally, I doubt the Spanish chronicler's assertion that her skirt was red. No one else mentioned it, and had she worn red, I think they would have, as that was the colour of Catholic martyrdom, and it really would have stood out on a proto-Protestant like Anne. Mary Queen of Scots wore red to her execution, for instance, and the point she was making about being unjustly killed for her faith was immediately picked up on by those who saw her. See my video on her execution for more details. Again, I'll leave it linked for you. For now, though, let's analyse what Anne's choice of clothing tells us. Just before I do that, though, if you're enjoying this video, please remember to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel with notifications switched on so that YouTube lets you know every time I upload. You can also follow me on Instagram and check out my Patreon page, both of which are linked in the description box below. And now, back to Anne. Starting from the top, Anne's choice of an English-style gable hood suggests that she sought to emphasise her position as an Englishwoman. She had spent much of her life in France, was being executed in the French manner, with a sword rather than an axe, and by a French executioner, and was famous for having popularised the French hood at the English court, which sat further back on the head and showed off the wearer's hair. Yet she did also wear English hoods, as this portrait medal of her struck in 1534 shows, and at the last she chose to identify with England, the country she had been crowned queen of. Next, we have the dress. Maria Hayward has noted in her article on the clothing worn to elite executions during the Tudor period, details of which are in the description box, that the most popular colours for clothes to dye in were black, grey and red. Black was an expensive colour, which suggested the condemned social position, but which was also in line with the mournful tone of the occasion. Hayward also argues that grey was a neutral colour, which, quote, may be an indication of the accused acknowledging their liminal legal position once they had been condemned. Red, as I've already mentioned, could be construed as the colour of Catholic martyrdom, but Hayward also contends that given its expensive nature, it also allowed the victim a last flamboyant act. On a more practical note, a dark colour or red were also wise choices as they would help to disguise the blood stains once the person's head was off perhaps making the job of those who had to deal with their bodies slightly less gruesome. It would also have made the garment easier to clean and repurpose, but we'll come to that in a minute. The neckline at the back of the dress is not mentioned in the sources, but Tudor dresses of this era tended to have square necks, like the ones you see on some of these waxworks of Henry VIII and his wives, and we can assume, as Anne's biographer Eric Ives has done, that the neckline of her dress was cut in that manner. Had it been higher and presented an impediment to the sword, she likely would have needed to disrobe further. As Hayward also explains, when necklines were high, the condemned often had to, quote, remove a number of items in the hope of a swift death. The fabric of the dress seems to have been damask, showing Anne's status as this was an expensive material. I couldn't find an image of a Tudor-era damask dress, no doubt because so few clothes survive from that long ago, but the brown material you see on this 18th century example is made of that fabric and gives you a very good idea of how luxurious it was. The fur of the cloak is likewise very significant. Not only was ermine expensive, sumptuary laws in force during this era meant that most people were not allowed to wear it, and by donning it Anne made another subtle reference to her high rank and position as queen. 
What would have happened, though, to these expensive garments after her death? When Anne Boleyn was dug up by the Victorians in the 1870s, which I have a whole video on that you can check out later, no remnants of any clothing were found with her, though that in itself doesn't tell us what she was or wasn't wearing when she was placed under the floor of the chapel of St Peter at Vincula. She'd been disinterred at least once before in the 1750s, which we know because a woman who died at that point was found buried underneath her by the Victorians, so even if there were any scraps of material left at that stage, they might well have been taken as souvenirs. More likely, though, anything she was still wearing had long since rotted away. It's unlikely, however, that she was wearing very much. Certainly her expensive hood and cloak, removed before her death, would not have been buried with her. As Hayward explains, given the value of the fabric, and perhaps embellishments on the garments worn by elite execution victims, their clothes generally went to the executioner, as a kind of perk of the job, and it is highly possible that the headsman of Calais who executed Anne was allowed her raiments. Certainly when Mary Queen of Scots was beheaded and all her clothes were burnt to prevent them from being used as relics, the fact that the executioner and his assistant did not get them and were instead given a cash bonus was thought unusual enough to be remarked upon. The alternative in Anne's case is that her ladies kept the items, having removed her dress and whatever footwear she had on before burying her. But again, this would have been highly irregular and there's no reason to suppose it happened. We can say, though, that it's quite likely that Anne went into the ground in just her smock. However, there's no definitive evidence one way or the other, and we could equally argue that, given her position as a queen or former queen, she was spared the indignity of being stripped for burial. In short, we'll never know. Now we come to modern on-screen depictions of Anne's final outfit. I don't have space to include every actress who's ever played her here, but I've put together images from eight different shows or movies which cover her execution so that we can have a look at how her final outfit has been shown and which production did the best. Apologies for the fact that some of these images are a little bit blurry. They're screenshots, so I just had to work with what I could find. Up first, we have Merle Oberon from the 1933 movie The Private Life of Henry VIII. The costume department here have created an almost exact replica of the dress Anne wears in her famous bee necklace portraits, and actually it's not bad as a representation of her execution outfit. It's a black dress in the appropriate style, and she wears a hood, though it's a French hood rather than an English one. There is no cloak, however, and I don't think this movie showed her with a linen cap or blindfold either, but I couldn't watch the whole thing online, so do let me know if I'm wrong. Next up, we have Genevieve Bouchold in the 1969 film Anne of the Thousand Days. The colour and neckline of the dress are good, and it has large sleeves, which is period appropriate. Miss Bujold does also wear a linen cap, though she has this on before she ascends the scaffold steps. She never wears a hood, however, her cloak is not made of fur, and there's no blindfold. The movie is brilliant, as is her performance, and the costume department were generally on fire, but there are quite a lot of errors and omissions in this particular outfit. This is Helena Bonham Carter in the 2003 TV show Henry VIII. The most startlingly inaccurate thing here is the colour of the dress, which is pure white. Presumably this was to highlight Anne's innocence, but it's completely at odds with the real woman's outfit, and I find it even stranger because Miss Bonham Carter was pregnant at the time of filming, and a darker colour would have helped to disguise her bump more. She's also missing a cloak. On the upside, the square neck and large skirt on the gown are correct, as are the cap and blindfold but the sleeves are too fitted and there's never a hood. We now come to Natalie Portman in the 2008 film The Other Boleyn Girl. The sleeves and skirt of her dress are too fitted for the Tudor era, but otherwise the costumer here did a pretty great job. Miss Portman wears an English-style gable hood, the only actress in our group who does so, has a dark-coloured dress with a low-cut back and a short white fur cloak over the top. She has a white coif over her hair, though this is already on under her hood and not put on on the scaffold, and my only other gripe is the lack of a blindfold, but I can understand that actors like to have the use of their eyes in a scene to communicate with the audience. Next we have another Natalie, this time being Natalie Dormer in the TV show The Tudors, and I think this particular episode at the end of season 2 also aired in 2008. 
This show has always been a guilty pleasure of mine and actually stays far closer to the historical record than a lot of people give it credit for. But an area in which it was consistently inaccurate was the costumes, and this one is no exception. The colour of the dress is all wrong, as Miss Dormer is in a kind of lilac shade, but the general silhouette isn't too bad, as it has a square neckline, cut low at the back too, and slightly flared sleeves, though this should have been taken further. The cloak is present and furred, which is good, but it's full length and mainly red rather than white. There's no hood or blindfold, though Miss Dormer's Anne does put on a coif before the execution. We now come to Claire Foy in the BBC's 2015 adaptation of Wolf Hall. The colour of the dress is good, but the skirt and sleeves are too fitted, and I've never understood what happened with her hood here. What she's wearing is neither a French nor an English hood, but what looks like a modern hairband with a veil stuck to the back of it. It's especially odd as this show had plenty of its cast members wearing period correct hoods. But anyways, she has a fur trimmed cloak which is good, though it's full length again instead of cropped, and only the trim is white. Later in the scene she wears both a coif and a blindfold which is also very good. Finally, she is one of the few actresses who doesn't have to take off a load of jewellery before the execution, which is a nice authentic touch because, as we've already seen, there's no evidence that Anne was wearing jewellery immediately before or when she died. Moving on to the TV show Rain, in which Kristen Pellerin plays Anne very briefly in a dream sequence. This show was renowned for the completely inaccurate costumes it often displayed, especially in the earlier episodes. And though this is nowhere near as bad as some of the other supposedly 16th century outfits it put its cast members in, it doesn't have much to recommend it as a depiction of Anne's final ensemble. It's black with a square neckline, which is good, but there's no cloak, no hood, no coif, no blindfold, and the cut of the dress is all wrong for the mid Tudor era. I am prepared to give this scene a bit of a pass though, as it is a dream sequence, so perhaps the sleeping Queen Elizabeth I just imagined her mother in this very odd outfit. Last but not least, we have Judy Turner-Smith in Channel 5's Anne Boleyn. The outfits in this show were actually pretty good as regards the silhouettes, even if I have always felt that Anne should have been more elaborately dressed just to set her apart from the other ladies at court, but the costume department haven't done a bad job here. The dress is the correct colour and cut, and Miss Turner-Smith did wear a hood, though it was actually a French hood with a white veil over her face, which wasn't accurate. There is no coif over her hair, but she had a furred cloak, even if it was too long, and the blindfold is present. Overall, this was a pretty decent effort, especially for a show which I don't think had a big budget. So what's my verdict then? Which depiction of Anne's outfit is the best, in my opinion? Well, for me, it's definitely Natalie Portman's In the Other Balloon Girl. That movie had its problems when it came to historical accuracy, but the costume for this scene wasn't really one of them. Other than the fitted sleeves and skirt and the lack of a blindfold, it was very well done, and if you're trying to imagine Anne's clothes in her final moments, this is the visual I would advise you to aim for, at least until someone else does it better. And that, my friends, brings us to the end of this study of Anne Boleyn's final outfit. As always, a big thank you to my patrons for supporting my work and helping me to be able to keep making videos for you. If you'd like to become a patron and get some history calling perks, head on over to my Patreon page by clicking the link in the description box and check it out. There's a two minute video available on that page which will explain how everything works for you. I know some of you prefer to make a one-off donation, and for that there's a thanks button underneath the videos which lets you give a preset amount and get a brightly coloured, customisable comment under the video and a one-time animation over the top of it. Again, if you opt to do this, thank you so much for your generosity, but please no one feel obliged to donate in either of these ways. Let me know in the comments below which of the on-screen versions of Anne's final outfit you like the best. And if you need another Anne Boleyn or fashion history hit right away, try one of these options next. Whatever you select, please enjoy, and until next time, keep learning. <laughs>